Grace to you and peace in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this worship video produced for First Presbyterian Church in Bluefield, West Virginia. We are delighted that you chose to join us through this virtual worship um, for the third Sunday of Easter Tide this year. I'd like to begin with a couple of announcements. First, the session for First Presbyterian will be meeting this Wednesday via Zoom. The session has been meeting every two weeks in the midst of this season that we've been in with the coronavirus. Um, we will be discussing um, perhaps a timeline of when to reopen and what that will look like when we get there. The Presbytery leadership met this week and the consensus was that we're not there yet, but the time is surely coming. So we will be sure to let the congregation and all of you know what the decision of the councils are as they are made. I'd also like to announce that this past week we had our first Zoom Bible study session for our new series for Christian education um, from the Epistle to the Romans, and we will be continuing that on Thursday evening. Um, hopefully those of you who would like to participate can join us on Zoom on Thursday night. And even those who don't want to participate in the Zoom discussion, the study guide questions are available for everyone to be engaging in the Word and in their discipleship in this season from home. And one last announcement I'd like to bring to everyone's attention. This past week was Administrative Assistance Day. And because we aren't in the office right now, um, we didn't celebrate it or mark it as we normally would. But I want to say a special thank you to Stephanie and to Anne. Um, they have continued to work partly in the office, but mostly from home during this season. They do so many things behind the scenes that help the church continue its mission. And I personally am very grateful for that. I know that many of you are. So if you get the chance to write a note, send a text, just let them know how much they're appreciated. Now let us turn our hearts and our minds to worship the Lord. Our first hymn this morning is number 697. For those of you who have a hymnal, take my life and let it be. Let us sing.
We're beginning a new series this morning for the remainder of the Easter tide season. For the next few weeks, we're going to be walking with one of Christ's best known disciples, Peter. We're going to be hearing from his letter to the early church, and we're looking forward to Pentecost when we encounter his famous sermon out of Acts 2. Um, but we begin this morning with this last resurrection appearance in John. And as we think about how this simple fisherman from Galilee was to become a great preacher and leader of the early church, I think that this encounter with Jesus is foundational for everything that happens next. And so I invite those of you who'd like to, to turn in your Bibles to the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John and hear these words from the book that we love. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you been fishing all night and you have no fish? And they answered him, none. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast out the net and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. Now the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, because they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. And when they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And a second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And Jesus said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? So Peter answered, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. 
He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after he said this, he said to Peter, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I am probably not alone in this when I say that it hasn't felt much like Easter this year. This is the third Sunday of Eastertide, and I know that Jesus is raised from the tomb whether we gather to sing our alleluias or not. But I really missed the alleluias this year. I missed getting up to sing at sunrise out in the cold and then enjoying a big Easter breakfast before the next service. I missed seeing kids dressed to the nines in their spring frocks and bow ties and out hunting colorful eggs. I even missed the lilies and I'm allergic to lilies. They make me sneeze and my eyes water but something about the smell is just connected to Easter. And I tried to keep the holy day, to use the Old Testament language. Um, you know, I preached the good news of the resurrection and I believe it with my whole heart. But I confess that I struggled to feel it this year. Deep down in my chest, it felt like something was missing this Easter. It felt like that sense of celebration that I've come to link to that Sunday just wasn't there. It was absent. And I've had to sit with that for a while. And the more I reflected on it, the more that I thought about those first disciples' experience of Easter and how they probably didn't feel much like they were celebrating anything either. And I found some empathy there. Because in the last chapter of John, chapter 20, John tells us, that on Easter evening, the disciples were locked in the house. They were huddled together in fear, even after they had received the good news from Mary. Now, maybe they didn't believe her, or maybe they were just confused because she was rejoicing, had seen the Lord. But Peter and John had just seen an empty tomb and didn't really know what it meant. And so you get the impression that the disciples are all together and they're still grieving. They're still kind of mopey. And it's into this that Jesus appears among them. And it's a mysterious encounter in the gospel. You read it and you see that he has to tell them twice, be at peace. In effect, you know, remain calm because he's just shown up in the middle of a locked room and shown him the holes in his hands. And they're happy to see him, absolutely. But I imagine that they're also pretty confused. I mean, what does this mean? He blows on them and tells them, receive the Holy Spirit. You now will forgive sins and they are forgiven or retained and they are retained. And I imagine that they're unsure as to what that is. Um, I'm not sure that the Spirit has found any further clarity for them. And I say that because one week later, they're still in the exact same place. Again, John says, the doors were shut. In the week between that first evening and eight days later, we know that they told Thomas, who wasn't with them, that they had seen the Lord and that he didn't believe them. But other than that conversation with Thomas, I have no idea what else they got up to. What were they doing? 
Did they even know what they were doing that week? Um, there's been a lot of discussion lately about how people react to communal trauma. Everyone that you know right now is experiencing something immense. Um, our collective anxiety is high and there's a lot of uncertainty in the air all around us. We've lost our routines and some of those regular habits and activities that help give our lives um, structure and a sense of stability. And maybe those disciples were living something similar. Perhaps it was hard to even realize that a week had passed, that they hadn't really moved because each day seemed so much like the one before. And over time, they started to run together. Sound familiar? Or maybe I'm just speaking out of my experience right now. But regardless, more time has passed, even since then, since those first two resurrection appearances. Time has passed, and we don't know how long, but it's later now, because we know that they've left Jerusalem. John tells us that he and his brother James are with Nathaniel and Thomas and Peter and a couple of the other disciples, and they're back in Galilee. In other words, they went home. They're back where they started from before Jesus showed up all those years ago and invited them to come and see what this journey of discipleship was going to be like. So they've gone home. But that old adage holds true. They can't really go back again because everything is different. Everything has changed. They're not the same people that they were before they left. And it's left them at loose ends now. They're different and they're not sure what to do next. And so Peter announces that he's going fishing. In other words, he's going back to the trade that he knows how to do. It's the same thing that he grew up doing. It's what he was doing before Jesus showed up. He is returning to the comfort of his routine. And the others all say, yeah, that sounds good. We'll come too. And that speaks to me right now because there's a lot of talk about this desire to get back to normal. In this season, there's been an immense disruption in our lives. And it's totally normal to want it to just fade away. We all want to go back to the routines that give us comfort. We want to return to feeling like we know what we can expect and what's coming. We want to be able to make plans and gather together without any restrictions or fear of the health risks. We want to feel that sense of celebration and be able to mark these occasions that are passing, like Easter and birthdays and graduations. We want to go back to work. We want to go to ball games and restaurants. We want to take vacation and visit one another. We want all of those things. And it's normal to want to go back to normal. But the sad reality that we're in right now is that we can't really go back. Everything has changed. It's going to be a long time before we're able to gather in large groups again, longer than any of us wants it to be. It's going to be a long time before the threat of this virus is truly understood and resolved. Yes, there are going to be treatments and tests and studies and the eventual vaccine, but all of those things 
take time. And there are going to be infections and reinfections and side effects and adverse reactions and complications. There are going to be more issues and consequences of this than anybody is able to predict right now. And even when we can kind of reopen things, we're gonna have to be very careful. There's gonna have to be thought and precautions that have to be in place. Distancing and disinfecting are gonna become our new normal. Carefully thinking through our interactions and our institutions is gonna be the focus of intensive energy, these conversations are already happening. And so as much as we all want to get back to normal, we're going to have to wrestle with some of these hard truths. We're going to have to recognize and allow ourselves space to grieve those things that are permanently altered. And so we're right there with Peter in the boat. Peter goes fishing and it doesn't work. They went out and got into the boat and they caught nothing, John tells us. These are folks who grew up on the lake. They have been fishing their whole lives. They know how to navigate the waters. They know how to cast the nets. This is a routine that has brought in plenty of results before. This is how they made their livelihood. This is how they fed themselves and their families and their villages. This is what they know and what they're comfortable with. But now they're trying to do all of those things to go back to normal and it's not working. They don't catch anything. And I can only imagine the frustration and confusion, and I share in that with Peter during this long, long night of fishing, casting nets, pulling them in, nothing but water. And then Jesus shows up in God's timing and with Christ's direction. They bring in a catch so large that they're struggling to haul it to shore. And this has only happened once before. And so they know immediately who it is that they're talking to. Jesus calls them in and just like years ago, he issues this invitation. What had been come and see is now come and have breakfast. And then he pulls Peter aside and has this conversation. And we begin to understand why it is that Peter can't go back to normal. Because Peter isn't called to be a fisherman anymore. Jesus asks if Peter loves him, and then he gives him a new assignment. He says, feed my sheep. The good shepherd himself is telling Peter that now it's his job to take care of the flock. And this fisherman from Galilee is going to become a shepherd, a pastor, and a leader in the early church. This uneducated village boy is going to preach to the crowds and the highest authorities in all the land. He's going to lead this new faith community through its infancy and be part of these conversations as they figure out together what does it mean to follow Christ, a risen, resurrected Lord. He's going to comfort the early church through persecution. He's going to encourage them in faith and hope. 
And eventually he is going to be martyred, as John says, to God's glory. The Spirit is going to equip this disciple to grow into everything that Jesus is calling him to be. And none of that looks like going back to normal. And all of the grief and all of the gifts of that are true. And so I imagine that at the end of this conversation with Jesus, Peter still isn't celebrating because he's got a really rough road ahead of him. And he doesn't even fully understand yet where it's going to lead. But he's proclaimed his love for Christ and he's been absolved from his denial. He's been given this new task and purpose, and now he can get to work with the other disciples, start figuring out what it looks like to tend the sheep. And so this is where I think we are too. This Sunday and in this season, we've inherited this mission of the kingdom. We're called to feed the lambs and tend the sheep, and we're realizing that doing so is probably not going to look exactly like what it has before. And some of us may feel just as inept and ill-equipped as a fisherman who's handed a crook and told to go out into the hills and be a shepherd on still wavery sea legs. But I firmly believe that the Spirit will empower us for this new task. In God's timing and by God's grace, Jesus will appear even in the midst of our moping and our nets will be full. We will rejoice in his presence and we will share fellowship over a bountiful meal. And even in the midst of our confusion and uncertainty, God's Spirit is still with us. It's guiding us to be disciples. It will grant us peace. And that is the good news that I am celebrating this Sunday and all through Easter tide. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Now is that part of our worship when we go to the throne of God in prayer. I hope that some of you will join us for our time of prayer over Zoom at 11 o'clock. But let us, wherever, whenever you are, bow our heads and pray together. Gracious God, in this season of Easter, we come before you grateful that our risen Lord Jesus sits at your right hand and even now is praying for and with us. We come to you thankful for his life, that your love was so great that Christ came and walked among us and showed us how to live in righteousness and relationship with you and with one another. We thank you that Jesus called disciples, men and women, to follow him, that they were empowered to preach grace and truth, and that we have inherited the rich blessings of their witness. Lord, we pray that we would feel your spirit move among us, and that we would also be equipped as your disciples to build up the kingdom of God to serve you by loving our neighbors and tending the poor, by feeding your sheep and sharing the grace and forgiveness that we have received from you freely. Gracious God, we pray for your church today, those that we love in our community and our siblings in Christ around the world. May you continue to faithfully guide us in this difficult season of uncertainty. May your spirit grant peace where there is anxiety, healing where there is illness, and comfort where there is grief. May we continue to feel your loving presence, which binds us together even when we are apart, and grant us the bold confidence to faithfully pray as Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 726, Will You Come and Follow Me? Let us sing together.
And now I invite you to go in the blessing of this Easter season. Go celebrating in the joy and peace of the Spirit. Know that you go under God's direction, that he is guiding and equipping you to be disciples of the kingdom and perhaps to do more than any of us could expect. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.